Hi, I'm Libby Buchholz, and I'm an assistant professor of the practice here at Duke University in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Have you ever wondered how CT images are made? Well, today we're going to take a peek inside the hood and, uh, and open it up so that you guys can get a better look. So CT stands for computed tomography. It's also known as CAT scan, which stands for computed axial tomography. The two people who invented CT, Sir Godfrey Hounsfeld and Alan Cormack, both earned very well-deserved Nobel Prizes in 1979, but it is a feat of modern engineering that we have these amazing systems creating images of our body every single day. So to start with, we use x-rays to create CT images. Why do we use x-rays? Who decided that anyway? We know that x-rays are harmful to our health. Well, um, x-rays, it turns out, meet two criteria, two chief criteria for uh, creating medical images. The first is that their wavelength has to be small enough that we can um, resolve small tissues. And so our resolution can never be greater than our, uh, than our wavelength. So we need to use only wavelength of light that will allow us to um, achieve that resolution. The second criteria is that it needs to be able to penetrate around 25 centimeters of tissue or it needs to be able to get through our guts. Okay, um, and so those two chief uh, uh, requirements basically eliminate everything except x-rays and gamma rays, and gamma rays are used in other imaging technologies that is not CT. So to create CT images, we need an x-ray tube, and physicists have been building x-ray tubes um, since the late 1800s, so this really isn't a problem. But unlike traditional x-ray, where we just take a single picture, CT is going to create hundreds of pictures, um, hundreds of different x-ray images together, and then we're going to reconstruct them all together to create the high-resolution images that you see um, CT images creating right now. And so to do that, we need to mount our x-ray tube in our uh, CT scanner. And that x-ray tube is going to rotate around our patient about three times a second. The x-ray tube is about the size of a VW engine, so this really is no joke. And we need to call in some, uh, some uh, mechanical engineers who are going to help us make sure that this is working and that it's calibrated correctly and it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be, able, uh, supposed to be doing. Then the x-rays are going to pass through our patient. Um, and so to figure out how the x-rays are passing through our patients, we need to talk to the biologists who are going to tell us what our body is composed of and what we can put in the body if we wanted to change that contrast, and the physicists who tell us how those x-rays are going to interact with matter to begin with. For CT, it's really important that our x-rays uh, both pass through our patient and are absorbed by our patient, and that they're done so differentially, meaning that in different parts of the body, they're going to be absorbed more or less depending on what part of the body they're in. So for example, if we had 100% transmission of our x-rays, that really wouldn't be helpful because then we would get no contrast. There would be no difference in the absorbance of x-rays through bone or liver. And so when we went to reconstruct our image, yes, we would be able to see through the body, but we wouldn't be able to see that, that this was liver or bone. We wouldn't be able to differentiate any of the tissues. So in order for x-rays, um, for us to get that, uh, those images that we need where we can see that different parts of the body um, are what they are, we need contrast. And to do that, we really need our x-rays, some of them to be absorbed and some of them to be uh, transmitted depending on what tissue that they're in. We call that kind, I like to call that the Goldilocks uh, uh, phenomenon where we need it to be just right. We don't want it to be too much transmission or too much absorption. We want it to be right in the middle so that we get that excellent contrast. Okay, so now we've had our x-rays pass through our patient and hopefully some of them have been absorbed and some of them have been transmitted and now we have to stop those. And it is extremely important that we stop every single x-ray that made it through our patient because otherwise, what were we doing in the first place? So we need to stop those x-rays and we need to convert that x-ray energy into some kind of electrical signal. And so the first stop is creating these special crystals. They're called scintillation crystals. And Einstein was the first person who discovered these phosphors um, in the mid 1900s. Uh, but now we use uh, pretty nice scintillation crystals such as cesium iodide or sodium iodide um, that will allow uh, a lot of light photons to be created. So every time an x-ray is stopped by one of these scintillation crystals, about a thousand light photons will be created. And to create these special materials, we really need material scientists to help us out. 
And so these material scientists are gonna build better, smaller crystals that are able to stop more X-rays um, and create more light photons. Because if each X-ray produces a thousand light photons, that means that we're gonna have a drastic increase in our SNR, which means that we're gonna get a lot more signal and we're gonna get a lot better images. Now, we need to convert our uh, photons, our light signal, these 1,000 light photons that we just created with every X-ray, we need to convert it into electrical signal. And to do that, we really need electrical engineers to come in. And for every single crystal those material scientists made, we need an electrical engineer to create a photo detector that will read that raw signal so that we can have that raw signal and start to reconstruct our data. Now, we have that raw data, and in the 1970s, when CT was first being made, that raw data was enough to spend, it could, you, it could take days to reconstruct your data. You could go in, get scanned for 30 minutes, and then they literally would not have the images for days later. Even today, with the amazing computing power that we have, reconstruction still takes orders of magnitude longer than the actual image acquisition. So in order to get that raw data um, and, and store that massive amount of raw data and process that raw data, we need, to, um, we need uh, computer scientists who are gonna help us with that. So we have the computer scientists who are helping us store this raw data and we need to process it into an image. And the process that we're gonna use to reconstruct it is um, known as filtered back projection. And this was largely developed by mathematicians who were sitting many, many years ago thinking about theoretical approaches to this and that. And, uh, and who knew it had a new life in CT and reconstructing our raw data. So this is an example of uh, raw CT data. Uh, the raw CT data is known as a sinogram, and it is just the set of all x-ray projections for all the different projections, and you can see that it kind of wobbles through the picture as you change um, the x-ray, the direction that the x-rays are coming. And then we reconstruct our data using a process known as filtered back projection. And what we do is we actually smear the raw data along the direction that was acquired and then add it up with the other smeared data and we smear all the projections until we have our uh, reconstructed image. And so you can see the image as we get more and more smears and we add them together, we get an image that is closer and closer to um, what we want it to be, um, to those high resolutions, fantastic images that we, um, that we are so used to seeing in CT. So to create our CT image, we needed a physicist to, to help us build our x-ray tube. We need mechanical engineers to, to put it into uh, the scanner. We need biologists and physicists to tell us how those x-rays were gonna interact with matter. We needed material scientists to build us special scintillation crystals. We needed electrical engineers to create photo detectors. We needed computer scientists and mathematicians to help us with the reconstruction. And all of that together is biomedical engineering. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.